uh, this thing hanging off the side of my head here. The first time that I did a, one of these presentations and they gave me the technology here with the, uh, uh, the microphone up beside my face here, uh, the lady in front of me got up and she said, you know, they're putting this thing on me. She says, this is wonderful. She says, I feel like a rock star. She says, I feel just like Madonna. And I'm sitting at the back and thinking, oh, that's pretty cool. Wonder who I'm going to feel like. Maybe, maybe Springsteen. Maybe feel like the boss. It could be. Don't laugh. It could be. I got up to the front. They put the thing on me, and I can only think of one thing. Would you like fries with that? <laughs> I don't know what that says about, but anyway. So we're going to talk about insurance, and I do recognize I'm the only thing between you and lunch, so we will try and keep on time. I will try and keep the technology under control. I was informed there is a self-destruct button on this. If I touch it, everything goes blank. So, how many people out here have insurance? How many people have the right insurance? There's a lot less hands out there. The majority of people will take less time to look at their insurance policy than the time it takes me to start from what I'm doing today until I'm finished and you're on to lunch. So that's only going to be about 40 minutes, right? So people don't generally take enough time to understand what's going on with their insurance. We have insurance because, well, we need to have insurance, right? The bank says we should have insurance. We need to be covered. It helps us cover off the risk, right? So that we don't have that problem of, well, if the barn burns, not only am I losing the barn, but I'm also going to be uh, without my house because I'm going to, they're going to foreclose on my, uh, on my operation. So insurance is really, really important, yet we don't really spend a lot of time uh, talking about it. So what I'm trying to do here today, I'm not going to educate you completely on everything you, you could possibly know about insurance. But what I do want you to do is understand a bit of what's on your policy, and if you don't understand what's on your policy, then you need to talk to your agent or you need to talk to your broker, and you need to get them to explain it to you. So that's what we're going to try and do today. So Webster's defines risk as the possibility of loss or injury. And I'm going to go through a few of the terms here that you might, that you might recognize or not recognize so that when I'm talking about them, you kind of understand what I'm talking about. So it's the it's possibility of loss or injury. And we also sometimes refer to it as a peril. So in insurance terms, when I start talking about a peril, does anyone know what I'm talking about? Yes? No, there's someone at the back there that, that put his hand up. What are you talking about when we're talking about a peril? Right, fire, flood, um, things that you're insured against. When, you're, when your policy responds, it'll respond to a fire, it'll respond to, to uh, uh, an explosion, it'll respond to water damage. If you go to uh, Webster's and go further from the insurance, there's risk has a lot of different meanings there. Uh, I mean, it goes from anything from the subject matter of insurance, which we talk about at the bottom there, or the chance of loss, um, or an insurance hazard, right? So audience participation again. We need to know what sort of risks as farmers do you face, and not just insurable ones, what sort of risks do you face? Yell them out. Weather. weather. What else? Fire, I heard. Injury. Injury. Divorce. Divorce. Yes, family breakdown. <laughs> Haven't had that one before. Um, the last time that I was here, I was actually, last time I was here to speak, I actually was working for the government at that time, and I was promoting a, pro a, a program called the CASE program. Everybody laughs about that. I didn't realize when I started out that CASE, C-A-I-S, really is a four-letter word. But we face all sorts of things. We face problems with politics, disease, interest rates. They're on the rise. That's a, a risk that we've got. And then we've got the insurable things like fire and wind and theft and that sort of thing. So when you face a risk, you've got several different things that you can do about it you can reduce the risk. So things like 
you know, if you've got an open flame someplace, you can take combustibles away from that. So things like a propane or a natural gas heater in your barn. Make sure that it's cleaned out, make sure it doesn't have dust on it. That sort of thing, to reduce what the risk is. We talked earlier, or Andrew talked about uh, thermal cameras. And I've got up there thermal imaging. So we're looking for hot spots in the barn. And the program that he's talking about with the cameras that are available are really terrific. If you don't want to go through that, talk to your insurance broker or your insurance agent and see whether or not that's a service that's offered by your insurance company. Because we have trained people that will come out and do a thermal imaging of your barn and check to see if there are any hot spots in that. So one of the other things that you can do is you can mitigate the risk. How many people have a fire prevention plan? How many people meet regularly with their employees to discuss what happens in the event of a fire? How many people have their employees, if they have any check for different spots, potential hazards there? Those are all things that you can do to mitigate the risk. You can have fire in extinguishers around, but you can also have fire prevention officers or fire departments come to your property, show them what you have, give them a map of where your facilities are. If, they're, if it's a large operation, uh, they, they will want to know things that may be risks, potential risks for them. How many people have pesticide storage on their property? How many people have told the fire department where that is in the event of a fire? Right? That's something that they're interested in. That's a, that's a pollution risk. That's a, a risk that they face maybe with explosion or something along that lines. The final one is the one that we're going to talk about today. You can transfer the risk. You pay somebody else. And that's your insurance company. You purchase insurance. So rather than you face the risk of that fire destroying and taking you completely out of business and maybe taking your, your home as well, you can pay somebody else to, uh, to take that risk for you. So insurance, we always talk about insurance as like a bucket. And everybody pays money into the bucket. And then there's two things that we use to get the, uh, uh, to, that the money comes out for. The one is for claims and the other is to manage that, that fund. Okay? We're going to talk about a few things today, uh, depending on how much time will depend on how far down the list here we get. Uh, I do hope to get, though, at least somewhat of uh, coverage on pollution coverage as well. But we're going to talk about some of the different coverages that are available there. Named perils versus broad form. So on your barns, how many people have a named perils coverage? How many people have a broad form coverage? How many people know the difference? Right. So that's where we're going to start. So a named perils coverage refers to the coverage that you actually have that dictates what risks, what perils are covered that your, your, uh, um, your building might be covered for. Fire's pretty standard, but there's a few others that are in there too that you want to be sure of. But in a named perils policy, it will list out in the wordings exactly what it is that your building is covered for. And if it's not listed there, it's not covered for it. So some of the ones that you will see, they're pretty common. The fire, lightning, explosion, smoke, falling object, impact by aircraft, land vehicle, or now spacecraft, uh, riot, vandalism, water escape, rupture, and freezing, not to be confused with overland flood. That's something entirely different. Windstorm, glass breakage, transportation, and theft. And one of the things that you need to be aware of is that is by no means an exclusive list. And it isn't necessarily that every insurance company will cover the same things. By and large, the lists are very, very close, but everybody has their own wordings. And the wordings dictate what coverage you've got. If you have any questions, ask your broker. That's question number one. If you don't know whether you've got broad form coverage or name perils coverage on your building, you should ask on that. So broad form coverage is also referred to either an all perils or an all risk coverage. And, and many of us in the insurance industry, we really, really hate that all risk coverage. And I'll tell you why, because it, it's misleading. So your broad form coverage works exactly the opposite as a named perils. Named perils, it lists what you're covered for. Broad form lists what you're not covered for. So. You, on one hand, it's this, 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 and this. And on the other hand, you're covered for everything except for 
this list. Well, you know what, that sounds pretty good. It is a better coverage. It does cover more things. And really, how much can you possibly exclude? <laughs> We're the insurance company. We invented fine print. I have seen co different coverages for various reasons where it says you have broad form coverage, you're covered for everything, right? Broad form coverage, and then it goes on in the next line to say that you're covered for absolutely nothing except for the ones listed below. And it sounds a little silly, but sometimes it's the way the wordings work. And for various portions of it, they may very, your insurance company may very tightly restrict what they will cover on that, where some other areas are far broader. By and large, your broad form coverage is the broadest coverage. It is what it describes. It's the better coverage. Mostly it's sold at a premium, although sometimes you can get a deal if you're depending on the uh, on your operation, depending on what it is that we're insuring. But not everything is covered. Things like rot, mold, uh, damage by vermin like mice, rats, uh, raccoons, that sort of thing, that's all excluded. And there's a, there's a lot of other things that are, are excluded out of that too. Remember I said overland flood, that's one that's excluded. Overland flood is excluded from that. Again, as with your named perils, it varies from company to company. So be sure you talk to your, uh, talk to your broker and ask, or your agent, and ask them, what exactly is it that I'm being covered for and what is it that I'm not being covered for? So we talked about overland flood. Has anybody heard the news about overland flood these days? Yeah. Well, Wes, we had a few down in Toronto, we had a few, and all of a sudden people have got their basements flooded and finding that there's no coverage. So the industry has been very proactive on this over the last couple of years, and many insurance companies now are offering overland flood coverage. Now, the overland flood coverage is not for agricultural outbuildings like your barn sheds and that. I'm not aware of any company that is offering the overland flood coverage for that. But your house can be covered. And uh, we introduced ours about a year and a half ago, inter introduced our coverage. And uh, we did have a little bit of pushback when we first covered it, because it's another coverage, and it char we charge for it. And then uh, in June, we had a flood uh, up in Harrison. We had a, had a bad flood up in, the, in this area, and all of a sudden, we had no more pushback on it. And people understood what it was that it was covering. And yes, you know what, even though you think you might not be going to get something, you really can. Uh, you really can get something. Uh, the other one that I want to talk about here is collapse, and certainly this year we're going to, uh, uh, our uh, engineering is going to be tested. Uh, we've had a lot of snow, and now all of a sudden we're going to get rain, and the weight on the roof is going to get fairly heavy for your snow. How many people know if they've got snow load coverage on their buildings? A few of you do. If you have broad form coverage, unless there's a restriction, you'll have coverage for, for collapse due to the weight of snow. If you have named perils coverage, you might or might not. It, it, uh, it's not a, a coverage that is included in the named perils coverage, but uh, most companies will add that on if the building will qualify for it. So actual cash value versus replacement cost. So your actual cash value, we, we always get into the fun of trying to figure out how do we come up with what our actual cost value is of that 150-year-old uh, bank barn that you're maybe running some beef cattle in, we've got some hay and some straw upstairs, it's in pretty good shape. Well, the first one there is replacement cost less depreciation. Well, after 150 years, if we go by that method, you're going to owe us money if that thing burns, right? So obviously, that building has value because you're using it. It's, it's acting as storage. It's acting as a, a place for the cattle to, to be put. So it has storage. It has, has um, some sort of a, a value to it. But we obviously, we can't use that. It more has a functional value to it. So what is it being used for? What's the use? What would it cost to replace that? You know? Like, so you're running some beef cattle. You probably, uh, if that went down, you could build a shed for uh, storage for the hay, and you could build a, a one-story barn for the, the beef cattle. And I mean, the, a beef barn is, is it's a fairly basic structure there. Uh, your replacement cost on a, uh, a two-story bank barn, uh, I mean, that can run somewhere up in the neighborhood of 100 to 120 bucks a square foot. Uh, and that's a big cost on that, uh, if you're going to a replacement cost on that barn. So replacement cost, 
is what it costs to replace that building with like kind and quality. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about this. Uh, I want to expand on a bit of the stuff that, um, that uh, Andrew was talking about earlier today. And he talked about the, uh, the issues that we have when a barn burns and what do you do when, you, when it comes time to clean up. And the cleanups are becoming more and more expensive. Uh, if you go back not that many years ago, if you had a fire on farm, you could bury livestock on farm. And though it technically is still legal, I can almost guarantee you, you'll almost never get permission from uh, OMAF or the Ministry of Environment in the event of a barn fire that to, to bury those animals on, on site. And depending what the, um, what the materials are in the barn that burnt, you may not get permission to bury the barn on site either, in which case it has to be trucked elsewhere. Uh, when we're looking at uh, doing cleanups here and uh, something like a large animal, so pigs or, or uh, cattle, uh, there's nobody locally that takes that. That ends up having to go out near Ottawa, uh, so the trucking costs on that are fairly substantial. Uh, something like a poultry barn, uh, especially if it's in cages and the litter, that also can't go to, uh, to the local rendering plant. Those generally go to a landfill site. Uh, and the last one that we had, that went down to Sarnia. So the trucking costs are becoming more and more expensive. What's that got to do with replacement cost? Well, your replacement cost is made up of two things. The first thing it's made up is the cost to actually build the barn back again. And the second thing is what it costs to clean it up. And cleanup costs now are running anywhere in around 10% of the cost of that building is what we figure it will cost to clean up that site and make that site ready to, uh, uh, to build on again. So there's 10% higher on what it is. Has anyone priced a barn in the last six months? Was it what you were expecting to see from a price standpoint or was it higher? Yeah, um, and that's a little bit of a loaded question, but uh, in the insurance industry, in the farms in Ontario, we use a, a book for estimating the, the replacement cost of, of buildings called the Carl Douglas Cost Guide. And uh, when the 2018 version of the, 20, of the Cost Guide came out, we saw a 20% increase on dairy numbers and 30% on poultry barns over what they were in 2017. And of course, as soon as we saw that, the industry kind of, kind of uh, nearly had a heart attack when they saw it. And so we started talking and looking to various builders. And, and what we're hearing is that if you can get someone to rebuild a barn in the event of a fire, because the, the builders are very busy, uh, yeah, it is going to be substantially more expensive than, than what you may be expe uh, expecting. So normally, I wouldn't spend that much time on this. But if you have a replacement cost on your buildings, you should really be talking to your broker or your agent and find out whether or not you've got enough on that. Check the limit that you have to replace that and see that it's sufficient because the limit is what you've got to put that barn back up with. And if you've got a barn that's worth a half a million dollars and you've got half a million dollars on there, there's nothing worse than uh, going to replace it and find out that, you know what, it's closer to 700, maybe even 750,000 by the time we get it cleaned up. So I'd urge every one of you, if you to have a look at what those limits are this year as you're going through. And if you think that you might be a little bit shy on some of those, again, talk to your broker, talk to your agent. There's ways that you can mitigate the costs of what the insurance will cost for, for that. Um, but in the event of a loss, if you're a couple hundred thousand dollars or more short, that can be a really, really... Uh, as bad as not having insurance at all because you think you've got enough to be back in business and you really don't. One of the other things that, um, that you run into is a, a term called co-insurance. And uh, co-insurance is for replacement cost buildings where we uh, in the insurance industry want to make sure that you put enough on that uh, so the event of a partial loss that you've fully insured that because the rates that we charge are based on the full value of that barn or the full value of the house, or whatever it is. So you, we want to make sure you're at 100%, or at least close to. So they may have a clause in there called co-insurance, maybe 80%, 90%, may even be 100%. And if it's, we'll take as an example an 80%, which is really common. If you insure a barn for less than 80% of the value of that barn, if you have a partial loss, you're only going to get the amount, the percentage that you have uh, insured that to. 
So let's take an example, and for easy numbers here, a million dollar barn, and you lose half of it, but you've only got it insured for $600,000. So only 60%. So even though that's more than the half million dollar loss that you incurred, you're only going to get the percentage that you insured it to, which means that you're going to be a couple hundred thousand dollars short on that insurance. So if you're doing replacement costs, that coinsurance clause is really important. You need to make sure that you've got enough on that because in the event of a partial loss, you may not get fully compensated, even if you've got a value of insurance that's higher than what the loss is. If it's not up where you need to have it, uh, you could find that, um, that payment was restricted. I'm going to quickly go through this one because we are a little short on time from what I'm, uh, where I want to go. GRC, Guaranteed Replacement Cost. This refers to your house. Talk to your agent or broker. If you've got your house insured to 100%, it may qualify where they guarantee it. Keeping in mind, everything is, everything is an estimate. Guaranteed replacement cost is what it sounds like. So if you, you insure that house for $400,000 with a GRC and it costs $450,000, the insurance company will pay the extra $50,000 if you have this endorsement on it. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, a single limit um, single limit policies or single limit products. There's a couple of different um, things that you may hear people talk about. You may hear talk, uh, them talk about POEDs, property of every description, or you may hear them talk about loss limits. Both of these are single limit, and, and what it does is it takes all of your buildings, and all of your livestock, and all of your produce that you've got insured to replacement cost, puts it under one limit. So if you have a loss and you're a little bit short on one part there, if you've got money in that limit, you can borrow to top it up. So as an example, let's take a, um, let's take a barn and a silo, side by side. You've got the barn insured for $400,000. you have got the silo insured for $100,000. Comes time to replace that. You only spend $350,000 to replace the barn, but the silo was $120,000. You're under that half million total, but you only put $100,000 on, uh, on that silo. You're $20,000 short, so in that case there, you wouldn't, even though you've, you haven't used all the limit from the barn, you're going to be short $20,000 to replace that silo. If the same situation occurs, you lose the barn and the silo, and they're under a single limit policy there, you've got a half a million dollars to replace the barn and the silo, three hundred and fifty dollars for the barn, plus 120 takes you up to 470,000. You're under the half million, you've got enough to be able to cover that. These products are generally for people that have, uh, um, have an above average operation. Uh, they're often at a, a, a very attractive rate. Um, if you have multiple buildings that are all on replacement cost, you should talk to, your, uh, talk to your broker or your agent and see whether or not that's something that it would, uh, it would qualify for, whether that's uh, an option there. Because there are a lot of products out there now. Um, I think it was Andrew who also touched about the weather. Uh, and we're seeing these 100-year storms coming every 20 years now. Uh, we're certainly in the insurance industry, we're seeing that as well. We're seeing more and more... Um, stronger storms that seem to be hitting at a greater frequency than what we're, we have been expecting. Of course, there's always a bright side to it. But what does that mean as a... Uh, uh, what does that mean for you? Well, one of the things that I'm, I'm going to mention to you, and it hasn't shaken its way down to your level yet as far as buying your policies, but it's probably going to come over the next few years. Uh, what we've been told and what we have seen is uh, our reinsurance costs. That's who we buy insurance from if, um, if we get a large enough risk that uh, it's more than what we want to cover. Those costs are going up, and uh, they're going up pretty substantially. Uh, and there are a lot of the reasons for that. The insurance industry has had some large losses. They had the hurricanes that uh, uh, came up through, um, through Florida, and uh, that's part of uh, what's driven some of the costs on our building materials, particularly plywood was, uh, uh, in December was uh, about 40% more than it was a few months earlier. And we've had the fires out uh, in Fort McMurray. And all of that, all of those replacements that the insurance industry has to soak up, eventually we all have to pay for that. Remember, that's that bucket. We all put the money in 
the money comes back out again to pay off those. So that's something that you're going to see probably over the next little while. Because of that, that's going to reflect in the insurance premiums. And uh, insurance is like any other business. They don't do it if they have to incur a loss every year. Um, if you look at our, our stock uh, companies, uh, they're going to need to make a profit. Their shareholders are going to need to, uh, to see a profit. If you're dealing with a farm mutual, farm mutuals uh, are set up, we don't, uh, we don't look to make a profit per se, um, but every year the, in, the stuff that we insure goes up in value, and we're regulated that we have to keep a certain amount of a surplus in order to be able to insure that, so we also have to see our surplus go up as well. Or otherwise, we're not going to be able to insure people when they come to us and say, hey, I've got a million dollar barn. And the last thing you want is your local insurance company to say, yeah, we don't have enough capital to be able to insure that. So we need, everybody needs to be in balance there. And if, if uh, we're in a situation where the insurance industry has sustained some very large losses, even though they're not in your backyard, uh, the industry itself is going, to, is going to compensate for that and prices will start to come back up or will start to come up probably worse news than I ever gave as a government employee to anybody. How many people out there have business interruption insurance? There's a few, not very many. It's probably one of the most undersold, uh, one of the most undersold coverages that we run across is, is business interruption. We just had a, uh, uh, just this morning came across the news, uh, I'm from near St. Mary's, and uh, we're trying to figure out right now, there's a large hog barn down there that's on fire, uh, and I haven't quite figured out whose it is, but I probably will before the end of the day. Um, but you've, you've had a loss. Your barn's on fire. And you're thinking, you know what, I'm okay. I've got insurance. I, I listened to what Mike had to say. I made sure I had enough insurance, a limit on that. I'm good to clean it up. I'm good to get back in business again. And you go to your bank and... and uh, the banker says to you, oh, that's great, glad to hear that. So what's your income for the next year when, we, uh, when we're loaning you money? And you say, well, barn burn, I don't have any income. That's a difficult conversation to have. Think about it differently. If you had a drive shed out front and it was $150,000 in value and it burnt and you didn't have insurance on it and you went to the bank and the bank says to you the same question, oh, you need a loan to build the build your shed back again, what's your income? Oh, well, I've still got income, I still have my livestock, I still have the rest of my operation, and they're going to say, okay, cash flow is good. But when you don't have cash flow, when you go to talk to a banker about it and you don't have cash flow, that's a much more difficult conversation. <clears throat> and particularly for livestock operations, it's something that you really should have is some sort of a business interruption in insurance. This protects against your income that your income will stop in the event of a, of a loss. Remember, your expenses go on. And ask yourself, can you survive a year without any income? Can your business survive a year without any income? And if the answer to that is no, then you need to really look very, very, um, very carefully at, at this. Because let's face it, the expenses go on and they keep piling up. And things that you don't think about, if you don't have that income, you still have to pay the mortgage, you still have to pay the insurance, you have vehicle payments, you have hydro, all sorts of things like that that will continue to go on. We're going to talk a bit about extra expenses as well. So we've got four different types that I'm going to talk about here today. What are we doing for time? Ten minutes, good. Uh, we've got four different types I'm going to talk about. We're going to talk about no-co, no-co insurance, profits, actual loss sustained, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about extra expense. Your no co-insurance is just exactly what it sounds like. You're no, there's no co-insurance requirement. So you can go out and pick a value, say $50,000, and you can have that as your, as your income replacement. And the only restrictions that you'll run into is sometimes there'll be a restriction that you can't take more than, say, 25% out over any 30-day period. So over a four-month period, that $50,000 could be completely gone. And for your operation, that might be just fine. That might be exactly what it'll do. But it's a 12-month indemnity, so right now the builders are a little bit on the uh, backed up, so you might have difficulty getting that barn replaced in just a few months. So you might want to go to something that is a little bit better than that. So you decide you'll go to a profits form. And the profits form 
is a little more substantial. You need to insure it to 100% of your insurable income, which is the part that would go on uh, in the event of a loss. And uh, that one will pay for any expenses that you incur or that you need to, to have. The income, just like it says, the income will continue to come in. So it'll top up to that 100%. It's a much better, uh, it's a much better coverage. Likely going to be more expensive because you're probably going to pick a higher limit for it as well. You'll probably have a higher limit on that. But it does have a limit. There is a limit at whatever, you, whatever that's set. And when that money's gone, it's gone. Also, it, it oftentimes will have a 12-month indemnity. That means that from the date of the loss until <clears throat> 12 months down the road, that's the time that it will pay out. And after that 12-month period, if you're not back in business again, well, the income replacement is over. Even if there's limit left, that income replacement is over. Actual loss sustained. One of the nice things about this coverage is that there is no limit on it. It is how much you actually have, the loss that you actually have incurred. That's one of the real advantages to this. The other, one of the other advantages to it is that many times you can get extended periods of time. So you can get an 18-month or a 24-month indemnity period. So it can stretch out over a much longer period of time. Something to consider is even on the, uh, on the others, talk to your broker, talk to your agent and say, what would it cost, or would the insurance company be willing to extend my indemnity period? Can I go to 18 months, or can I go to 24 months? Because that's one of those things that in the time where we're having difficulty getting builders to come in and build, you might be 18 months before you get that barn put back up again. In all cases, there, we're going to have a look at your books. We're going to see how, what your expenses are that continue, and we're going to see what expenses there are that don't continue. Uh, some of them will stop. So if you have a barn full of pigs, you're not going to need feed anymore, right? But you may have uh, a situation where you have a, a multi-site and you lost your feed mill. So you're going to have to actually have somebody make feed for you. And so that would be an expense that would continue on. I know we have a lot of people that are in the cash crop industry here. Some of you may have uh, an elevator or a storage. If that should go down, you're probably not going to need a business interruption per se because you've got the physical crop when it burns or, or is destroyed, that's covered. You need a crop coverage for that. But what you might need, you might need an extra expense. So you no longer can bring that crop onto your farm because that, that elevator is gone, so you have to truck it another 10 miles to get it to somewhere else, to another one. You may have storage costs because you're going to store it there. Those are extra expenses. And, and talk to your agent, talk to your broker, and ask them, am I covered? Is that something that I, uh, is that something that I've, I need to um, uh, look at? Okay. I'm going to skip through some stuff here. Quickly. And get to liability. So everything we've talked about so far is what happens to your stuff in the event, in the event of a disaster. Liability is not for what happens to you. It's for what you do to somebody else. So you make a mistake and you're legally liable for something that causes them a loss, whether that's a physical injury or maybe you parked a piece of machinery in their barn and you're like a tractor and the tractor caught fire and burnt the barn down. You would be legally liable, right? You could be held legally liable for that. The question we often get, how much liability insurance should I buy? How much is enough? And if you ask almost anybody in the industry, their, their question is going to be to you, how much can you afford? Because there really is no limit to what someone might sue you for if, if you have a, um, something that you're legally liable for. Uh, I can remember driving a car with half a million dollars of liability insurance and thinking that was more than I'd ever possibly need, <clears throat> and then increasing it to $2 million and thinking, well, that's fantastic. I'm great there. But now we're seeing a lot of people that are talking $5 million for liability and, and larger limits based on what it is that you're, you have that you're covering in your potential operation. That's something that is a discussion. Um, two million is now fairly standard. We see that on most farming operations. They have $2 million liability. But we do see a lot of people that will uh, 
uh, that will go beyond that. Or maybe use something called an umbrella policy, which will cover both your property insurance and your auto insurance. You'll have an underlying insurance of $2 million of liability, and then that umbrella may add either a three or an $8 million liability to the top of that. And that might be something that works well for you, you but you've got to, that's something you need to talk to the, uh, talk to your broker about, find out what, it work, what works for you, what works best in your situation. Pollution coverage, two parts to it. There's a liability portion, which is covered under your, your, your pollution liability, but there's also first party. Some of your cleanups can be quite expensive, right? You can get into twenty-five and thirty and fifty thousand dollars, and if it doesn't leave your property, that's not a liability issue. That's a personal. That's a first party. That's you that has to clean that up. Uh, and if you think that uh, you think that that doesn't get expensive, uh, just get Ministry of the Environment involved in the spill, and uh, it can be quite expensive. Somebody backs into your fuel tank and it runs down the driveway. Think about what the potential could be there. <coughs> If it gets into a drain and off your property, it's a liability issue. But man, oh man, if you just let it sit there and watch it go because it gets to the drain, it's covered. I, don't, I think there's some government agencies would not be very happy with that. So the takeaway messages. Know what you're covered for. Ask if you don't know. Question. Talk to your, your uh, broker. Maybe the number one thing is make sure that you're meeting with your broker every year. Make the time. It's really important. It's really important because the last thing you want to do is find that you're not covered for something that you thought you were and if you'd just taken a half an hour or an hour to sit down with him and talk to him, you could have been covered for that. I always end with these two pictures. So when your barn looks like that, it's too late to say, gee, I wonder if I've got the right insurance. Because in an hour, it's going to look like that. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be free to answer those for you. Yes. I've got a 1993 combine. Yep. Uh, you can buy that model of combine for approximately 15000 I take it to the dealer, get it rebuilt, look after it real good. It does the job for me. Mm -hmm. I insure it for 50000 Yep. Say that combine burns. Am I going to get 50000 or am I going to get the 15000 Even though I've well maintained it and spent maybe 25000 above the fifteen or 20000 that it cost. Unless you can prove that that combine is substantially different from the one that's sitting on the, in the dealer's yard, you're going to get whatever it costs to replace that. So your example there where you've well maintained it, and you can document that you've rebuilt it and all of that, that may mean that you get a combine off the dealer's lot that's in prime condition or that they will go over it and you say, I want the, the gears replaced, I want the belts replaced, I want this replaced, and it costs you extra to do that. But if you can buy that for less than that $50,000, then you're going to get whatever it would, uh, whatever it would cost to, uh, uh, to buy that off that dealer's lot. Question back here? Yep. Um, as well as farming, um, I also sit on some uh, farm organization boards. I was interested in your liability coverage coming up there. Um, it keeps coming up every once in a while around the board table about the, the uh, liability and the director's and officer's insurance we have as, a, as an organization. Yep. Um, just what kind of targets are you seeing people uh, taking out in insurance like that and, and uh, any other comments about that? Other than I can say that it's one, something that's extremely important when you sit on a board that you have that uh, director's insurance. Um, but I can't give you much of an answer on that. It's something that I can look into and ask, but it's not part of the uh, insurance industry that's my specialty that I spend any time on to be, to be sure. Uh, in many cases, though, you, you should be looking at something. If you look at what um, anything over and above that they don't pick up, you, you could be held personally liable for. So you want to keep that, as an organization, you want to make sure you keep that as high as you can afford. Nobody else. Awesome. Um, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions or think of anything during lunch, uh, I'll be around here somewhere for the rest of the day.